You're watching Saki Chronicles. Look, all I'm saying is that it's weird. Explain yourself. How is there a USB dongle back in 1998? The first one to ever hit the market was around 2000. First of all, how could you possibly remember that far back with your geriatric riddled brain? Secondly, Umbrella is a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company with state-of-the-art tech. I mean, for God's sake, they had not one but two giant facilities underneath Raccoon City. And you're wondering how do they have a USB drive before the millennium? Point made, but even so, you're telling me that none of the other STARS members thought it was strange that this new device the world has never seen before is not only used to allow access to their own armory, but also that someone has made it into the shape of one of their badges. I guess not. Like I said, weird. What's weird? Besides the fact that we're here before you are, Joe and I were just discussing the anomaly of sci-fi tech in a video game. We were? Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds like it was a lot of fun, but let's get this going. We're here to rank the Resident Evil Revelation characters from both 1 and 2. We'll do what we did for the previous ones and ending with the main ones. Then I guess that would have us start with what, the Skag did? The one that actually talks? That motherfucker was creepy. You two must be best friends then, huh? Ass. Yeah, this bitch was a bit unsettling with him crying and screaming while he's also puking up literal bear traps at you. Gotcha, bitch! Not to mention that for some reason the T-Abyss virus just mutates a working buzzsaw for his hand, complete with revving noises too. Either that or he's making the noises himself like a fucking cartoon character. And we're supposed to believe he couldn't get out from a chained room with that working motor tool? He's nearly beating the door off its hinges, for fuck's sake. I agree with Barry. This fucker was disturbing. The whole time he's trying to tell you to stop and that he's human. <laughs> However, if it weren't for the numerous ads that come to help this chubby fucker, he'd be a cakewalk. Isn't that what having too much cake does to you, fat boy? Fuck off and tell Jill to change your diaper, you old sack of shit. That's enough, you old hags. And I agree with Donnie. The ads are really the only thing that makes his fight even remotely challenging. However, since it's still possible to get overwhelmed and die, I think it's okay for low C. Nah, fuck that. This bitch is so easy to shoot and keep a distance from that. If you do end up dying, that's strictly your own fault. A complete skill issue of the lowest degree. D tier. I'm with Don. Fine, whatever. He's not worth arguing over. D it is. So let's move on to Rachel then. Jesus, this woman's wetsuit was literally bursting at the seams. Keep it in your pants, Donnie Christ. Why? She can't do it either, even in death. Okay, you idiots. The impracticality of her wetsuit aside, this is another character that seems to be thrown in without any thought to it. It seemed like she was only there to get a couple cheap scares out of the horny players before becoming a nuisance to deal with. Wait. Don't you ever quit? I'll admit that it is creepy when you're walking around and then you suddenly hear her calling out to you around a corner. That shit almost made me brown my pants the first time. Too easy, Joe. Not even worth it. What? Is she even really considered a boss? She's more like a bullet sponge with mutated airbags. Pops in and out of ducks for a bit to chase you around, but enough shots makes her run away like a scared cougar. And not only does she grow into a thick mommy for some amazing reason, but her head just splits open like a fucking Pez dispenser to unleash that weird parasitic thing that ate Gollum from the King Kong movie. For Christ's sakes, this virus is weird. Why is her hair just wrapping around her leg? Maybe that's why whenever she runs, it looks like she needs to take a shit. I agree that this T-Abyss virus does weird shit. The skag dead. Surprise, motherfucker. Rachel. And whatever the fuck happened with Jack Norman. But we'll get into that later. Back to Rachel. I find her story, however small it is, both sad and a little fucked up. She was forced to go on this mission in the first place, immediately gets separated and ambushed, and then writes about what the virus is doing to her while she's still alive, losing an eye and ripping her arm in half. Tragic background aside, like Donnie said, she's also a bullet sponge. Only this time she waddles off if you do enough damage to her before popping up in unexpected places. I would place her around low C at least. Agreed. I can sleep with that. Jesus Christ, Donnie. I'm hoping you meant the decision and not Rachel herself. Well, duh, like I'd slide up next to something that hideous. Too easy, orange boy. Not even worth it. Fuck you. Moving on, let's talk about the Dragonazzo. 
I get that this thing is technically the first true boss you encounter, but it just comes out of nowhere all of a sudden, literally dropping itself onto you before sticking its mutated weak spot in your face. Yeah, no shit. And the lack of history behind this thing already gets to me. Like, where the fuck did this thing come from? What was it originally for the virus to mutate it into that? Even Parker is questioning its existence. What the hell is this thing? How is it even alive? Almost as if the developers were also questioning themselves. Is it like a crab? It's got a shell and barnacles, but then why the fuck does it have hair? Looks like Kayako from Juan got it on with some unsuspecting crustacean. Nice. Basically, all you do is run around, try and dodge his rush and floor pound and shoot the weak spots. Granted, they're not glowing, so there's a silver line. But with the way that it just appears without any buildup or backstory at all, it feels so slapped on that it's not even worth a C-spot to me. I'm more than down with that. Again, this kind of shit reeks of RE5 bosses, and you know how I feel about them. I mean, if it was a mutation of a human turning into that mess, I'd be okay with it. But then the fucking thing just falls apart when it dies like an infernal in Warcraft. So with no explanation to its existence, and the fight being basically the same as fighting Bane in Arkham Asylum, this is looking pretty much like a D tier to me. Objections? Nope. Now go for it. Done. Okay, let's move on to Malakota. Another fucking turret section! In the second phase, but you still need to get there first. Sure. There's the fight at the beginning where you just shoot the parasites that horrifically rip out of the sides. But there's no real tension from that fight at all since Kirk just keeps throwing rocket launcher after rocket launcher to you. As long as you stay healthy, you should have no excuse to not beat its first phase. Fire chill. Back. That's working. That is true. If you mastered the dodge mechanic, you're pretty golden in this fight. Just another obstacle, boss. Nothing truly difficult about it. Plus, a large portion of the fight is a turret section. D tier, honestly. Yeah, I'm okay with that. It's not very impressive. I got a question. Where the fuck did this thing come from? What was the T-Abyss virus possibly used on to make this fucker? It doesn't matter, Joe. Just like with that crab fucker, he's just there to pad out the runtime, I suppose. Maybe Capcom has a quota for bosses in their earlier RE games. I'm just wondering because if it's got parasites in its body, then they're in its blood. And that thing is literally bleeding into the goddamned ocean. And since sharks can smell blood for miles, they'll be feasting on its corpse, most likely. This whole thing is just an ecological disaster. Good, we need more shark bosses anyways. We've already had a couple. We're not talking about six, so let's keep that in the ground and buried where it belongs. Moving on to some humans now, starting with Jack Norman. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Okay, am I the only one who just didn't give a fuck about this guy? I mean, shit, he's like Deborah Harper. You see him once before when he's infecting the fish, and then he just drops out of the entire game until the last 20 minutes or so. No cap, this guy and his whole shitty organization were so lackluster to me that I would constantly forget about them. And how the fuck did these fuckers survive being in a sunken ship for over a fucking year? How did the monsters not kill them? Or, more importantly, the motherfucking air supply never running out? They did die, though, as martyrs. Martyrs for what? They didn't fucking do anything. Lansdale gave them the ships, the equipment, and the virus itself. Christ, without him, Veltro would have been like ten guys with a shitty yellow flag somewhere in Jack Norman's surplus garage. I mean, how was I supposed to take a terrorist group seriously when they named themselves after a fucking greyhound? That's because the entire game has an obsession with Dante's Divine Comedy, much like how Revelations 2 had for Franz Kafka. Isn't that the God of War clone that Visceral did? The poem, you idiot. Both Revelations had a theme, which made the villains do whatever they did. But in the end, it never mattered. We don't play these games because some grad student wanted to insert whatever book they love to read during English 101. Okay, we're getting off track, so I'm hopping in. Norman was a dull character and was only used by both Lansdale and the plot to make him an endgame boss, which in my opinion, he didn't really deserve. But holy fuck, was this dude resilient. I mean, he survives being under the sea for over a year, injects his fucking self with a virus that mutates at an alarming rate and nothing happens to him and then injects himself a second time and goddamn did this motherfucker win the mutated boss lottery no kidding next to wesker's pretentically form this boss had the coolest powers fucking teleporting and mind fuckery and god help you if you didn't learn how to dodge correctly All that power, yet still has his heart on the outside like a fucking tyrant. What a fishy asshole. C-tier. Being a fightable boss is his only saving grace, so yeah, I'm good with C. Same. 
Okay, let's move on to fucking Morgan Lansdale. Christ, this dude looks like a villain from the word go. It would have actually been more of a twist if he wasn't the bad guy. Absolutely. The first time you see this asshole, he says things like, Let the heavens scorch the earth with justice. So it's only obvious when he turns out to be the villain. That the lowly terrorists would receive a helping hand from the venerable commissioner of the FBC. Well, who didn't see that coming? No shit. And his entire motivation is just Simmons. Granted, he came first, but still, using a B.O.W. attack on a populated city to gain power and control. Full soon shall thou be where thine eye shall answer make to thee of this, seeing the cause which raineth down the blast. What the fuck are you talking about? Jesus! With how many times B.O.W.'s are used on purpose, it makes Umbrella look like what they did wasn't that bad. I mean, shit! At least what they did was an accident that quickly got out of control. He had to be stopped! Christ, he's got a point. Compared to the rest of the villains in the franchise, Umbrella's not that bad. <laughs> and doesn't this asshole say that Chris and Jill were the ones that brought them down? Uh, I should have expected as much from the duo who brought down Umbrella. When in reality it was the stock market? Soon its stock prices crashed. And for all intents and purposes, Umbrella was finished. Back on topic, Lansdale to me was as generic as they come. Nothing special. Literally, a bad guy with a suit, bland as cardboard. The stupid fucker can't even target the correct ship for fuck's sake. Well, the proud Queen Samiramis. Or, how about the fact that if Morgan can just look at the ship with the satellite, then how come a simple drone can fuck up its targeting with chaff? And I don't think that's how chaff even works against a fucking satellite. This dude was incompetent, even trying to arrest O'Brien without any evidence to back him up. Like, did anyone really think he was going to win? Not to mention that a hidden camera is what brought him down. What a cliche ending to a cliche villain. Fucking D. No question. Done. Okay, let's keep going with O'Brien. Oh man, this dude looks exactly like Columbo. There's no way around it. I couldn't think of anyone else talking except for Peter Falk. My name is uh, Columbo. Oh, listen, one more thing. Well, my wife, she says I'm second best, but... Uh... She claims there are 80 fellas tied for first. Isn't that the detective guy from the early 70s? The one with the cigar? I don't know, I'm more of a law and order man. NYPD blue for me, and yeah, I loved how in the picture of him and Lansdale, it looks like he's a fan or something. Almost like in that picture with Michael Scott from The Office. They're the same picture. You two show some respect for the classics. Anyways, back to O'Brien. Unfortunately, his character seems so mediocre that yet again, I would forget he was around. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know he's the director of the BSAA, but there's so many moving pieces in this game that it's hard to keep track what's going on sometimes. No cap, the constant twists and turns in this entry happen so often that you need a neck brace by the end of it all. We'll get more into that while we rank the next two, but let's keep going with O'Brien. Even with what Joe said, he still gets this whole thing kicked off. I'll go back to HQ, take charge of the search and rescue. You two will be my eyes out there. His initial suspicion of Lansdale and subsequent investigation of the Veltro ships brought everything to light. But at the near expense of his field agents. The dude is nearly as bad as Chris is in Village. I mean, shit, this dude makes them go into several death traps without any extraction points or anything. At one point, they say they need to get off the ship, and he denies the request. Boss, get us out of here. Sorry. But I can't authorize that. Yeah, but that's because Chris was too far away. Chris is traveling by sea. He won't reach you in time. My point exactly. These two have been on that ship for what seems like hours. Enough time has passed that he was able to send the Wonder Twins to some remote area. So you're telling me that while Parker and Jill were fighting for their lives, he didn't have a second team on standby the entire time they were radio silent? Not to mention that he just keeps everything a secret from one of his best agents. Because he knew there was a mole. So he doesn't trust Jill, a person who has the reputation of bringing down Umbrella? Okay, Dunn, you've made your point on this. Let's just rank him already. Bottom line is that even though he created a ruse to revive Veltro in order to get to Lansdale, which technically was unethical, it still worked. Although it nearly cost everyone their lives. 
It's time you learned the truth, Ms. Valentine. He was still respected in the end and even took responsibilities for his actions and resigned. He's a low B character, I think. Nearly cost them their lives. Are you getting senile as Joe is? Fuck you. It did cost a life. Did you already forget Rachel? Oh shit. Oh yeah, I did. No surprise there, old man. She didn't even want to go on this mission, let alone be unlucky enough to be paired up with someone who had ulterior motives. As far as I'm concerned, her death is solely on his hands and a needless one at that. That makes it even more pathetic knowing that nobody really gives a shit about her afterwards. Well, fuck, it does feel like she was just swept under the rug when you put it that way. So I guess C-tier then. At the very most. Yeah, I agree. What a disaster. Okay then. Next would be the aforementioned Wonder Twins, Quint and Grinder. Oh my god, these guys. Worthless. Somebody was on fucking crack when they created these two. One is an idiot and the other keeps him in check. Ah! Shh. Weren't you the one who said to stay quiet? Well, even Homer sometimes nods off, you know? Psh, that doesn't even make sense. I actually agree with Donnie on this one. Being forced to play these jokers in Finland was the definition of a chore. All for a stupid USB stick and an exposition from Quint. Their entire campaign could have been reworked for Chris to find, since his ass doesn't really do anything in this. If I recall correctly, doesn't one of them say the word tits in reference to something that would be great? My only hope is it has a high-powered CPU. That would be tits. Jesus Christ, this fucking guy. I want to say that he's the most annoying character in the franchise, even more than Irving and that shitheel, Steve Burnside. Father! We may agree on that, Joe. All this piece of shit does is some shitty computer hacking if he isn't too busy referencing shitty films. He's turning guppies in a jaw. Quit, two boy, uncovering secrets, one and dead or alive, just like a falcon in a snowman. This is definitely for mature viewing audiences. Did you just say Jaws was a shitty film? Sure, his personality is fucking strange, but we can't give him too much shit. He at least does his job correctly. Exactly. Only some of the time. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Hmm. At one point, doesn't he admit to straight up stalking another colleague? So, you followed Jessica home. You know where she lives now? <coughs> Almost. I had her until the very end, but I lost in you that... Hey! You think I'm a stalker, don't you? <laughs> you said it. Not to mention that he leaves Grinder on his own to fight mutated wolves like a fucking jackass. Come with me. Quinn, don't just leave me here. Damn computer nerds. Which is also his code name if I remember correctly. Jackass here. It's as if even the BSAA knew what this fucker was like. Okay guys, let's reel it in a bit. First off, we're ranking them both, not just Quint. And so far you've just been ripping into one half. Grinder isn't annoying, at least, and he sometimes keeps Quint in check. If you need someone to sniff something out, ain't no one better than my boy here. Hey, I'm right here, Grinder. Secondly, Quint at least finds out that O'Brien is the one who's behind Veltro's resurfacing. Director O'Brien, Veltro was never back in action. It was all smoke and mirrors orchestrated by yourself. All to get into the head of one certain somebody. Uh, you pretty much got it. Sorry, Barry, but like I said earlier, their entire side story could have been given to Chris for more screen time. And even though Grinder may be the better of the two, that doesn't mean shit to me in this case. Quint drags them both down. Uh, I hate Snow. <laughs> Snow hates you. D tier. I have to side with Joe on this, Bear. Yes, Grinder is playable, but not for very much. In fact, I'm pretty sure you spend more time watching them both in cutscenes than you do actually playing as Grinder. And to be honest, I'd rather plead guilty than listen to Quint's shitty East Coast accent any longer. Absolute D. Nah, fuck that. Grinder is still playable, although minimal at best. And even though Quint is annoying as all fuck, he still does his job. It's just a literal grind to get there. Plus, Quint helps prove the FBC's involvement with Veltro. They're mid-C at the most. At the very most. I can deal with that. Done. Let's move on to Raymond. Okay, this motherfucker looks like Rocky Dennison Mask, and I know that I'm not the only one who thought that. This fucking dude was the definition of boring. He doesn't do anything at all, except be suspicious every chance he got. Nothing will change, unless you get your hands dirty. They seek the truth about Terra Grigia, 
and vengeance. It didn't help that this idiot nearly tackles Jill when they first meet. To be honest, I would forget that he was even in the game sometimes. I guess they needed him to keep the whole Veltro conspiracy thing alive, but it didn't even do anything for me. In fact, when he's even dressed as one of them and begins to explain what's going on, he gets shot. Don't you dare die. Damn. Raymond? What a twist. He doesn't even get to finish explaining. What a tool. He was constantly switching his employment. He's with the FBC. Now he's working with O'Brien. Oh, but wait, he's actually working with Jessica. How can we take a character seriously when it turns out they're a triple agent? It's like playing as a little kid and switching sides so that you'll be the winner. But that's not fair. Is so, is so. He's also guilty of the one thing that I hate in this game the most. What's that? All the fucking bait and switch deaths that happens. There's at least four of them in this fucking game. Raymond, Quentin Grinder, Jack Norman, and the worst one of them. But we'll get into that later. So where does this guy rank? He's a nothing character. In fact, I bet that most people forget about him whenever they think of revelations. He's only ever around to subvert expectations and be a twist in the storyline, which, may I remind you, never goes anywhere anyways because he never shows back up whatsoever. It's been over 12 years and nobody has heard of Raymond Vester ever again. D-tier. Oh, no joke. D-tier all the way. Don't forget that he doesn't even give a shit about his other FBC partner at all. He asks about Rachel once, and then that's it. I can't reach my partner, Rachel. Damn it. I haven't heard from her since she went to the bilge. Oh good, you remembered who she was. And I couldn't agree more. D-tier it is. Okay, let's move on to Jessica. Oh yeah, possibly the thirstiest bitch in the entire Resident Evil franchise. Me and my sweet ass are on the way. Oh man, no cap. This woman would only ever have one thing on her brain. Whether it be trying to fuck Chris. Great, a cruise, just the two of us. Only the whole thing is sinking. Being jealous of Jill. She was your partner before, right? Yeah, my partner from before. What about it? I was, you know, just asking. Do you trust me as much as Jill? There's no need to compare. I trust you both. Constantly reminding Parker that he owes her dinner. But you're buying me dinner next time. And I'm ordering lobster. Just don't forget about that lobster dinner you owe me. And you owe me another dinner. Or just being flirtatious. Also, am I the only one that thought her wetsuit design was so impractical that it was obvious what the developers were trying to do to her? Like, what is the reason for having only one leg covered while the other isn't? Are you both bitching that she has too much sex appeal? Shit, you guys were ripping into the new Ada for having that taken away from her OG counterpart. There's a difference here. On one side, you have new Ada with nearly zero flirting, and the other side is Jessica with an overabundance of it. OG Ada is right in the middle. I mean, the moment Parker brings up director O'Brien, she immediately tells him she wouldn't date him. So, what do you think about that O'Brien guy? The SAA director? Not my type. <laughs> That's not what I meant. This isn't Goldilocks, you rug-wearing shit stain. I think what he's trying to say, Bear, is that perhaps the developers were trying to create a new sexy character. However, they overdid it with her dialogue and even her outfit. She stays with Parker to help evacuate people during the panic. It could be argued that perhaps she wasn't really helping the people as much as whoever she was really working with. It's already proven later that she was a triple agent. Either way, it's not like any of it matters. It never goes anywhere and she doesn't use it to fuck over her comrades, which yet again is another twist that they had to put in this game. No kidding. The moment that she needed to do something else on the ship, I knew she was going to be the traitor. Okay, we should split up then. There's something I need to check on first. Hold it right there. Parker? The spy has infiltrated the BSAA. I am shocked. Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Which unfortunately puts her into the same boat as Raymond. Yet another character who is switching teams left and right. 
all for it to lead to the final big twist in the end, where it shows that her and Raymond were actually working for someone else in order to get the T abyss virus. It's so goddamn convoluted that it's no wonder Capcom has never brought them up again. I'll agree with you that she's basically the same as Raymond. However, since she's still a co-op partner for both Parker and Chris, and there's more interaction with her than Raymond, that makes her C-tier at the most. She's just as forgettable. Fine. Whatever. Stupid men. Okay, guys, let's get to Chris then. I don't know if it's because this game was mainly for Jill, or if it's because Chris had his own game back in five, but he seems to be more of a footnote in this one. He's barely in it at all. No shit. They didn't utilize him fully in this one, hence why he should have been the one to go to Finland. Instead, we get a precursor to RE8 Chris, coming in at the last minute after everyone has already done 90% of the job to help kill the final boss. At least Roger Craig Smith came back to reprise his role. He's still the best Chris we had, hands down. Perhaps this is where Chris gets the idea of keeping things from people. The balls on this guy to demand that O'Brien tell them everything, but won't do the same for Ethan. Come clean with us, O'Brien. Don't leave anything out. But sir, couldn't you have at least told us? We really should have told Ethan the plan. There wasn't time. Even so, you should have told him. I would also like to point out the fact that Chris doesn't give a fuck about pilots either. Like, I know we've already stated that if you're a chopper pilot in this franchise, you're fucked from the word go, but goddamn, Chris, have some compassion. The pilot! Don't worry about her later. Christ, that's cold. Maybe this is the starting point where he began to throw teammates away like fodder. And speaking of inhuman traits, isn't there a scene where Chris and Jill are just talking normally with respirators in their mouth while they enter the Queen Dido? Blobs we found on the beach. They came from here. That explains why Morgan cordoned off the area. I also loved it when some steel beams fall. And for some reason, Chris can't just move around the side to link up with Jill. I'm okay, but I can't get through. I'll find a way around and meet up with you. Let's get down to it. His gameplay was decent, much like the others. There's really nothing special about him in this one. Most of the time, when I think of the first revelations, I don't think of Chris. This was Jill's game, through and through. Agreed, I think the lack of his presence really does hinder him, even if he shows up to take Parker's place in the end. Low B at the most, in my opinion. I can deal with that. Same. Good, now let's get to Parker, a true MVP. No joke, this guy was dope all the way through. He sticks with Jill through everything and is a great partner. Much like Sheva in five. Plus, he brings the punches too. I agree, he's a great character. Even his personality shines in this entry. He sticks around during the panic to help people. And even though Jessica is there too, I will admit that it seems more genuine with him. It's not in question that he cares. We did do everything we could, right? I hope we did. Case in point, he saves Raymond's life. All right, cadet. Now you off one. Twice. Parker! Absolutely, the guy was great and deserves a high ranking easily. Whoa, now hold on a second. Bullshit, Joe. Are you fucking serious right now? Listen, I will agree that his gameplay is good, but only because it's similar to everyone else's. But you're forgetting what we've already said, that he's unable to use the upgrade crate. And as for his personality, although he's a great guy, don't forget that it's because of his mistrust for Raymond for some reason that he allows Jessica to get the drop on them in the first place. Parker, it's me. I can't trust you completely. Not yet. Put your gun down, Raymond. Yeah, you're too soft. Don't be fooled, Parker. I mean, shit, he had Jessica dead to rights and even confirms that she's most likely the mole. But then just because she pushes her charm on him, he fumbles the fucking ball. Him getting shot is really his own damn fault in the first place. Stupid Parker. Whoa! Are you suggesting that his altruism is only half ass because in reality he deserved to be shot? I'm saying that he made a mistake that put everyone's life in jeopardy. Jill, Chris, Raymond, everyone. The damn ship was exploding and all the evidence was destroyed because of him not literally pulling the trigger. That didn't matter. They still got the evidence from Jack Norman later on. And either way, thank God he saved Raymond before because he returns the favor. That's the spirit cadet. First off, the burning ship and Parker's inability to walk is all because he didn't stop Jessica. Secondly, don't get me fucking started with his quote, death scene. 
I said earlier that all the fake out deaths were the worst part in this game, and his is the worst of them. Fuck, he's too wound up on this. Just let him say his piece. It's okay for main characters to die, especially in deep emotional scenes. It helps the viewer feel something for the character's last moments. Good times, Gio. It was a nice ride. What? See you guys. But when you then have them live for some unexplainable reason, it cheapens it. Like Trevor in Castlevania, or Maeve in The Boys. These characters sacrificed themselves, and it was incredibly emotional, only to have it ripped away because of reasons. And you think Parker's death scene was cheapened? The dude fell from God knows how far into a fiery explosion and still had a crippling bullet wound, only to be seen minutes later being saved by Raymond. In the end, he only had a busted leg, and the best part is that he's yet another missing person on side character island. Case in point, how would you honestly feel if Piers had lived in the end? Somehow he escaped and is back at the BSAA reading comics or some shit. Okay, I see your point. That would be lame as all fuck. Can we please just rank him already? No joke. Take a heart pill, Joe. You're about to fucking die. Fuck the both of you. Sacrifices are supposed to mean something, not have it mean shit just because a writer is too scared to let their precious character go. C tier. No, fuck that. I'm the same. Fuck that shit, Joe. Granted, with what you said about his ending, he's still a great man who helps Jill out nonstop. A tier. Absolutely. Fine, whatever. I've said my piece anyways, let's move on. Done. Okay, let's finish the first revelations with Jill Valentine. She was great in this, for real. And since it had been a decade since she had the chance to star in her own game, it was also nice to see her again. Well, just like with Parker, there's really not anything bad going on with her in this. She controls great, she still kicks ass, especially since she can customize her weapons. And speaking of which, thank God they only gave her a few to carry instead of the massive weapons roulette they would later implement in six. No kidding. I would also like to say that her back and forth with Parker was nice, too. It really helped show how well they worked with each other. By the way, what's the deal with that guy in the gas mask? What's his game? She's definitely still the master of unlocking. And she's incredibly lucky with the slots. However, with all that being said, it's a bit unfortunate that you don't get to play her as much as you should have. The fact of the matter is that even though this is supposed to be her game, you're forced to play as Grinder, Chris, and Parker in both his past and present states. A lot of time that could have just been given to her is split between all these personas just for a conspiracy plot. Overall, it really does hinder her. I see your point. In fact, come to think of it, why couldn't they just make Jill be a part of the panic? She could have been flown in with O'Brien to protect him or something. That would have given more screen time to her, especially since it's weird that Chris and Jill are nowhere to be seen during this time, but O'Brien is? Yeah, that is weird. Why were we forced to play as the Italian Stallion so much? Back on track, I'd have to probably say that she's a solid A in this one. That's it? That's all we got for Jill? There's really nothing much to say about her, and that isn't bad. In fact, the more we talk about a character, it's usually because of some shit they do. But Jill in this game is great, as we've already mentioned. In fact, Looking back at all her games where she's the main protagonist, oh. she's been rocking the top tiers since 99. What about RE5? Get a new battery for your hearing aids, Joe. That's Chris's game, not Jill's. And I see what you mean, Bear. Overall, she's not like any of them in Six where it felt like a chore to play as. She's smooth, professional, and still a badass. I can agree with A tier. Same. Awesome. All right then, we're done with the first revelations. Before we get into the second one, is there anything else you guys want to add? Yeah, I was wondering about their casino. You need to get into the VIP room if you have 107 grams of weight exactly. So anyone with a few coins can just waltz right in. And why did the Genesis find something in the tits of that cardboard cutout? Or more importantly, why was there anything in there at all? I actually didn't see an issue with that, Creepy Joe. Yeah, you wouldn't. All right, you guys, let's just move right into Revelations 2, starting with Gabe. Oh man, Gabe, you tried so, so hard, my man. But to be honest, the moment you said you could pilot that chopper, I knew you were doomed. No joke, his fate was sealed. Do you think you can fly this? Once I repair it, there's not enough voltage. At least he did his best to keep the group together. Yeah, in the most macho way possible. Go! You stay the hell alive, Fisher! Shit, even Neil had to compliment him with a cliche expression. Look, don't worry. He's ex-military. The man eats danger for breakfast and craps it out by dinner. And he loved using those puns, too. I'm no lab rat. 
She can stick it right up her all seeing ass. Hell yeah! <laughs> Oversee this, bitch! <laughs> Overconfidence, shitty puns, and flying a chopper. This dude was the perfect mixture for a dead character in this universe. Yeah, but he was still a good character, not annoying like Pedro or shady like Neil. This dude actually tried to help the others. And even when he was about to change, he took a fucking knife to himself. Guy went out in a blaze of glory while fucking laughing too. C tier. Wait a minute. Hold up, Donnie. Fuck you guys. How can this Chad possibly be in D? He's only in cutscenes, Don, and not that many of them. In fact, his entire screen time amounts to maybe five minutes, and don't forget that his chopper fiasco creates the perfect distraction for Neil to snatch Natalia. Sorry, fatty, but them's the breaks. Fine, fuck you both. It's not worth the argument. D tier, then. All right, let's move on to Pedro, then. The balls guy? Mother of balls! My life is awesome! This fucking clown only had two character traits. How much he was pissing himself. Pedro! Huh? Don't scare me like that, Claire! And how much he just loved balls. Oh, balls! Kish! Balls! What's the round, dude? No shit, this guy got annoying real fucking fast. Like, almost by the time he was established in the tavern, I was ready for him to fucking die. <laughs> uh, any requests? <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you both on that. The only positive thing this shaky little shit did was work on the bracelets, which pinpointed where Alex was. I managed to trace the bracelet's transmissions. They're coming from the north, someplace high up if I had to guess, because we're getting full bars. Other than that, all he did was shit his pants. Oh, I'm gonna die! I don't know what to do! It was only a matter of time that he would become a monster. I was just surprised it was as a boss. It means he's a and of course, he's a one-hit boss, too. I just want to say that I'm glad that he keeps up the Kool-Aid man tradition. God damn it, did he still have to have balls on the brain, even as a monster six months later? And how is he not disintegrated like all the others when Barry encounters him? Did the power of balls keep him perfectly preserved that entire time? No idea. To be honest, he was a mid-character with an even more mid-boss fight. I'm gonna go with C tier. Same. Yeah, he can still kill you, so C is fine. Let's start up with Neil Fisher. You know, if they had given this dude more screen time, then I'm sure that I would have given more of a shit about him. Literally, whatever this guy does, I just didn't give a shit. We're just told that he's a good friend of Claire's and that he was the executive for Terra Save, and that's it. The guy pops in and out so frequently that much like in the first Revelations, it wasn't even shocking that he turned out to be bad. No cap. Almost every line out of this douche's mouth was suspicious. Even the first time he meets up with Claire, he has a shitty excuse for how he survived being separated from the group. Yeah, but I run fast. Gym membership. And when he's with the girls, he's contradicting Claire, whom he knows has had experience in this kind of situation. The Overseer might be inside. I say we go find out. Uh, bad idea. We should wait for dawn. By dawn, we might all end up like Pedro. The clock's ticking, Neil. The stepping stones to his betrayal were too obvious, like when he tries to throw blame onto Alex, only to immediately reel it in. Why the hell did the Overseer turn a whole island into whatever? Assuming she did. And when an opportunity comes to split up, he can't suggest it fast enough. The dude was shady, and he rolled a one for subtlety. Come on, you freaks! Catch me if you can! <laughs> Gym membership. I love how his actions are so obvious that even Moira figures it out before Claire. Look, there's something I gotta tell you. I noticed something when Neil was with us. His bracelet never changed color. But we'll get to that subject later on. When Natalia gets snatched, it's only obvious who did it. And what the fuck was his motivation again? He just wanted to create another terrorist threat to justify the FBC because he was Morgan Lansdale's underling? <laughs> There's no bringing the FBC back. 
I failed myself. That's so fucking stupid. You're an idiot. But I guess they needed something else to tie in Terra Grigia other than Natalia. It's flimsy at best, but I see what you mean. Basically, this tool gets turned into a monster, of course, and becomes the classic bullet spongy charge and dodge boss that we all know and love. And as you fight him, he begins spouting out his fucking world domination manifesto. Like Capcom has an overabundance of villain motivation and monologues locked and loaded. I just don't know if it's because he actually believes it from the beginning or if it's the virus talking. I don't know, but I'm going to have to give some props to the voice actor, Yuri Lowenthal. The dude puts in 100% to his role at least. Too bad he didn't do the same for Finn. Suck it up, Finn. Sorry, sir. That's two characters he played that gets roasted. Three if you count his voice as Ben 10 and Alien Force. All right, so where do we put this motherfucker? Because we haven't even talked about the fact that his fight is the actual moment in the game that gives you the different endings. And if you've been playing Claire this whole time and didn't know to switch to Moira for the killing blow, then you fucked yourself for the bad ending. Shit, I forgot about that. It's a weird place to put a choice system, but honestly, I didn't mind it. If he was the key to Moira overcoming her fear of guns and on her way to being a better character, then so be it. But with everything else about him, he's pretty much a C-tier character. But like you said, his existence is what pushes Moira to conquer her demons and move forward. Shouldn't he go higher because of that? Sorry, Joe, I'm going to side with Donnie. That's giving Neil too much credit. He may be the cause of her arc, but she really did it on her own because you can still get the job done with Claire. And with everything else we've talked about him, I'll agree with C-tier. Fine, I can live with that. Any questions before we move on? Yeah, I got one. So his mission was to kidnap people who have a low tolerance for fear, right? That's why he specifically snatched them all at the TerraSave gathering. Ugh, TerraSave, the organization that has the absolute worst slogan. TerraSave. Because Ter doesn't have to end with a risk. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Well, maybe it is stupid, but it's also dumb. Fuck, even the villain in Death Island throws shade at these jokers. And Claire Redfield. <sighs> You think your group helps people, but they don't do anything to stop the actual cause of all the suffering. They offer bandages instead of real solutions. So my question is, why the fuck did he grab Pedro? That dude must have shown earlier signs of being afraid of his own shadow. Ah, don't scare me like that, Claire. No way do I believe that he's faced unspeakable horrors and that his psyche valves were peak. No shit. I also want to know who the hell are the men that came in guns blazing because we never see them ever again. The island didn't have any military personnel to fight against, so were these just mercenaries? And also, if you get a look at the list before they all get snatched, you can clearly see Natalia's name on there, which means she was specifically invited to this exclusive party, and since she's an orphan at this point, there must have been some guardian that brought her. So did they report her missing for six months? And how did Moira and Claire not notice this little house on the prairie girl walking around the other party goers? And speaking of Moira, Neil didn't even know who she was. Moira, I don't think you actually met Neil. He's our boss. Neil Fisher. You're Barry Burton's girl, right? Your dad's in the BSAA? Yet he has her name on the list too. What's up with that? Jesus, you're really hung up on this list. Well, it doesn't make any sense to me. Either Natalia was at the party, as the list suggests, wandering around with a teddy bear among executives and other big wigs, or she was already on the island, which begs the question, why is she on that list? And Moira on there is just as confusing to me, too. Yeah, how did he get psych evaluations from someone whom he's never met, but also who literally started that day? Hey, that Barry Burton's girl? Yep, Moira started today. And what kind of unspeakable horrors did Moira even face? Okay, guys, listen, the list is just a flimsy plot device that's shoehorned in here for Claire to find to give some kind of evidence that Neil was a traitor. That's all it is. So stop wasting time on the stupid list and let's move on. Jesus, Barry. Okay, Bear, calm down. No need to stress so much that you age yourself any more than you already have. I am calm, you fuckers. Let's just get to ranking Alex Wesker already. Right, the female Wesker. Two Weskers. You gotta be shitting me. 
Yet another character that was forced into being related to Albert Wesker for obvious reasons. When they created him, Capcom broke the mold. But it's obvious that they've been trying to fix it ever since. First time. <laughs> Her existence was confusing to me. So these events are happening after RE5 and the Kijuju incident. Just like Kijuju, man. Fun shit. Those freaks had some of the same symptoms as Ouroboros. It's a virus some bad people used in Africa a couple of years ago. So that means that Wesker has already been to see Spencer, and he explains that only one child survived. The Wesker children were entrusted with endless potential. Of them, only one survived. You. So I find it hard to believe that this extremely powerful man didn't know that one of his test children had also survived alongside his golden boy, this is an odd statement by Spencer, I agree. Especially since there's a document stating that she works for Umbrella later on in 5. As well as his memoirs in the Lost in Nightmares DLC, where he specifically mentions Alex a few times, but not by her last name. So it makes me think that her being a Wesker was an afterthought, yet again. You can't really take the paper seriously, Bear. I mean, there's also one that mentions an Ethan W. as well. And that also means that some painter out there also knows about them. Poor bastard probably was killed immediately. Plug in the leaks like yeah. Just another plot hole when it comes to Wesker's bloodline. So let's get into this, and for starters, although her very presence is problematic for the timeline, I don't actually mind it too much. She was a very competent villain. In some ways, she's a more believable jigsaw than Lucas was. Motherfucker! Absolutely. Like we said before, the entire game felt like a love child between Saw and Resident Evil, and her role as Overseer was a welcome one. The bracelets, the traps, the constant surveillance. It kept to the theme and didn't really waver throughout Claire and Moira's campaign. Until you got to the secret lab. And just to be clear, her motivation was to find a person that she could implant her consciousness into, but she had to find someone who was incapable of being afraid. Something like that, yeah. So she decided on a little girl whose parents died in Terra Grigia. Because if that makes her immune to fear, then she probably could have snatched up Sherry Birkin too and ended up with regenerative powers to boot. I mean, that kid got fucked up. Don't talk about little girls, Joe. You know what the court said. Fuck you, Barry. Yeah, her plan always seemed to be overly complicated to me. Plus, there's that six-month gap in between the two campaigns that leave a lot of questions open. Like, she finally gets Natalia and plants her consciousness into her and then just makes her lay dormant for half a year. Six months from now... You're going to awaken as me. But then she Kurt Cobain's herself. However, at the very last moment, she feels fear of dying. And the Phobos virus mutates her into something resembling Ellen DeGeneres and a homeless man. My question is, why did she inject herself in the first place? Who really gives a shit? Besides, human Alex was the whole reason why the island is the way it is. People being used as test subjects and shit. Monsters running around but Monster Alex was cool too. And even though her obsession with Natalia was a bit interesting, she at least had a pretty dope boss fight. Yeah, I agree that her fight was sick and shit, using air vents to move around, and her new grotesque form is pretty cool too. But goddamn, she just never stops fucking talking. And having an extra fight sequence for the good ending is nice too. It definitely helps to wrap things up with everyone. Also, I'd like to add that it was nice to see that she even laments her brother's death. A little fucked, I know, but still kind of interesting. I understand how you felt now, Albert. It's not enough to live. I want to transfer. All that being said, I would say she's probably a solid B. Her plan was too complicated, even backfiring during her first death because she injected herself for some fucking reason. But her overly complicated plan did work. She successfully implanted her consciousness into Natalia no matter which ending you get, good or bad. Alex is inside her, waiting to come out. Nevertheless, her entire existence is just another way for Capcom to keep milking that Wesker cow and make up new shit. Really, Saki, did you have to use the comic with my face on it? Fuck! Either just bring him back, or keep him in the ground. Don't bring out a sister who tried to prove that she was better at virology than her brother was. Anything you could do, I could do better. Ha! I can do anything better than you. I'll go with B tier as well. 
Okay, fine. We've talked way too much about her anyway, so be she goes. And since we've already mentioned her multiple times, let's start up with Natalia Korda. Oh man, I can feel Creepy Joe using all of his power to hold back the urge to tell us what aroma her hair gives off. Jesus Christ, you couldn't help yourself, could you? I bet you all the money in my account that he pressed his nose against the glass trying to smell it. Hey, fuck you. Don't bet money you don't have just because your shitty truth app is on fire. Fucking got him. Anyways, back to Natalia. To be honest, not a whole lot to say, really. Along with Neil, her backstory is basically the only thing that connects this game to the first revelations. I did, however, like that she doesn't have as much plot armor as Sherry does, and can actually die if you're not too careful. I'm okay. You know, you get more and more sinister, Joe. I don't know what you're talking about. How did you guys like her powers? You mean the obvious ripoff to The Last of Us? A massive award-winning game that came out two years prior? Where Natalia can see enemies through walls if she just crouches and listens and also hits fuckers with a simple brick? And now that I think about it, like Ellie, she's also completely immune to the virus that seems to have eradicated an entire population as well. However, I guess it's okay, but honestly, if Claire and Moira can run around without it, then Barry shouldn't have any problem either, really. And I'll be honest, I hated that you had to be her in order to find objects. Oh, fuck yeah, I hated that shit too. Since she's the only one who can see them in order to literally point them out, you were forced to run around as her a second time after you cleared a room. That shit got annoying real fast. At least they explained why, though, Dark Natalia or some shit. And it wasn't too bad. At least it got interesting when she would point out the little invisible flying shits. Even though a simple gas grenade did that just fine, too. Also, side note, did either of you notice that Moira's coat in her epilogue story looked almost exactly the same as Ellie's did? It crossed my mind. And speaking of lookalikes, did Claire's outfit when she was in the chopper look similar to Ada's in RE4 Remake? Okay, sorry I derailed us. Back to Natalia. So as we've already said, she's mainly there because Neil grabbed her for Alex. After Alex puts herself into Natalia's brain, she's able to survive alone on an island of monsters before Barry finds her. That's pretty impressive, not to mention how she was able to do that before meeting Claire and Moira, and without Dark Natalia to help her. So you managed to stay away from the monsters all by yourself? Uh-huh. All in all, she's pretty decent. And since we get way more screen time and gameplay with her, she's an essential character, especially since the villain's motivation surrounds her entirely. Whether you get the good or bad ending, Natalia has a piece of Wesker inside of her. It's just too bad that she never comes back or does anything significant. So I would put her in C tier as well. That seems about right. I mean, she's still a child that only came in one game. And even though there are times where she was able to fend for herself, she still has that plot armor. So C is good. Done. And just before we move on, I just wanted to say that since the Burtons both went all over that island, maybe don't have fucking Kafka laying around the house? Since Alex was so obviously obsessed with him, I would think that any written or drawn material of his should be treated like a loaded gun in their household, lest some mindfuckery happens. A cage went in search of a bird, but now the bird is gone. Yeah, no shit. Then again, her mind was most likely already fucked, since she was legit thinking a stuffed bear could talk. Hiya, Natalia! I'm Lottie! Nice to meet ya! Nice to meet you too. Joe, come on, that was obviously Alex fucking around with her as Dark Natalia. Yeah, aren't you the expert on manipulating little girls? It's a legit observation. She's ten, for Christ's sakes, and still thinks stuffed bears can talk and leave postcards? I tear my eyes out. All right, we need to move on, so let's get started with Moira. Oh, Claire, I just want to go home. And I want to say that, yes, she's a bit cringy with all the fucking teenage sass and angst. Another one of those walking shit stains. <clears throat> Sorry, I mean butt stains. And you know what we do to butt stains. But throughout the game, I found her to get gradually better and better. Are you fucking kidding me, Barry? You actually like this edgy little shit? Almost everything out of her mouth was either some lackluster way of being funny. <laughs> Irony sure is a dick. I got you. Fuck you, Hollywood. That wasn't even close to easy. Or just constantly bashing her father to no fucking end. Do me a favor and don't put Barry and me in the same sentence. Stupid dinosaur. I'm so sick of men like him. You mean men like Barry. 
That shit was grating each and every time she opened her mouth. She wasn't that bad, Donnie. Cut her some slack. Jumping on your horse already, you white knight. She's too old for you. Oh, fuck off already with that shit. Focus, guys. Let's just get the bad stuff out of the way first. Yes, Donnie's right. Her constant bitching of Barry was good for characterization. But since she overdoes it so much, it did get annoying real fast. Basically, she's just a regular teenage girl. Well, that blows. But at the time of the game, she's 20. So she's just covered in animosity for her father especially since it's over something that isn't trivial at all. This isn't like she was caught sneaking out at night. Christ, she shot her sister. And by the sounds of it, Moira was not a little girl. Like, what the actual fuck was she doing playing around with a gun in the first place? Barry explains that it was his fault that he didn't keep it locked up. Was it Moira's fault? No, it was mine. I guess I never really got around to taking the blame. So he's a little more strict with her and for good fucking reason too. It mainly sounds like Moira's the one who keeps the tension alive between them. Not according to her. You say, hey, let's turn left. And he goes right, just so he can feel like he knows better. Again, and I guess I have to reiterate, this is not like she accidentally crashed the car. She shot her fucking sister. She grabbed a gun, put her finger on the trigger, pointed it at Polly, and fired. Okay, that's enough. We're not here to start a campaign on gun control. Fuck that. Second Amendment all the way, baby. Every American has the right to hang a pair of bear arms on their wall. How could that possibly be misconstrued? Careful, Don. You get any more hot-headed, and you'll catch that rat's nest on fire. I don't share the same opinion on this, however. First off, the banter between her and Claire was great. Oh, that looks comfy. Yeah, let's take one home. And yes, I will admit that her dialogue was pretty bad in the beginning, but she was also the only one who felt more like a regular person thrown into a nightmare world. Oh my God, what the fuck? What kind of whack job were you? Ugh, this is not okay. <laughs> Fucking statue! She was a voice for the player. Until the script makes her believe in something that is utterly ridiculous. This might work back at that retinal scanner. I don't know why that makes sense, but somehow it does. It's ridiculous! Utterly ridiculous! So she's adapting. We want that in our protagonist. Remember you, Orangutan? He's right, Don. Even her gameplay technically evolves. She goes from being just on flashlight duty to stomping fuckers with her crowbar. What hurts more? A? Or B? I would also like to point out that at a later point in the game, she's more level-headed than Claire is. Hey, Barry, be very careful what you're about to say. You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. It's true, Donnie, but fine. We'll hold off on that part for when we rank Claire. Back to Moira. Her past kept her mindset in a cage, refusing to adapt even in the harshest environment. You need a gun too, Moira. No, I really, really don't. Sorry, I don't do firearms. Not after what happened. She just used the crowbar for everything. However, if you go for the good ending, she finally breaks free of her fears, making her the only character that has a true arc. Don't you want a dildo <laughs> That's some epic shit right there. Not only that, but in the DLC, she also learns to forgive and love her father. You mean the DLC you have to buy in order to understand how the fuck she survived being completely crushed by two tons of concrete? Not to mention that her bracelet never changed colors even afterwards. As for the bracelet, mine never changed color. And I never turned into one of those things. You telling me that Alex Wesker mutates from the mere split second when she pulls the trigger but Moira never does? And the only explanation to her survival is an old man who apparently hulked out off screen to save her? The old man pulled my battered ass out of the wreckage and patched me up. Is he master motherfucking Roshi or something? That's some C-level shit right there. Come on. Fuck that, Donnie. Now I will agree with you 100% that having to buy DLC for answers to a character's story is utter bullshit. However, the bracelet thing can be easily explained by Moira simply accepting her fate and having no fear in dying, whereas Alex did. Save your... It's okay. Don't look back. He's got a point about the old man, though. I will admit that it makes no sense at all how he saves her. Like, are we supposed to believe he pulled her out of the rubble when the entire building exploded and collapsed on top of her? Not to mention that you still have to buy the DLC to fully get her character arc. Without it, you don't see how she came to forgive her father. If he wants to be overprotective, let him. I'd rather put up with that than make him spend the rest of his life wishing he protected me more. 
I will agree that the old man saving her is pretty stupid. And although I'm completely with Donnie about buying answers to finishing character arcs, we have ranked others based on their DLC in the past. Fair is fair. So I vote A tier. Yep, solid A. Fine, fuck you both. Let's get on to the Chad dad himself. Fuck yes, Barry motherfucking Burton. Oh man, it was so good to play him once again. I actually had more excitement to play him than Jill since he's been MIA for 13 years. Absolutely. This beautiful bastard was truly the shining beacon we needed in this game. He was practically flawless. You know, I'm not even going to argue that point. The man comes loaded for Bear to save his daughter. But unlike Ethan, this alpha knows what he's doing. He still has some of the best lines too, from official dad jokes. Well, this should give us a whole lot more options. To great one-liners. <laughs> Who's the master of unlocking now, huh? What is going on? And even says the best line of the game that sent literal chills down my goddamn spine. But for now, I have this. Oh, chills. Literal chills. A thing of beauty, that line. Don't forget that he also apparently tells other people the jokes he makes during horrific situations. I was almost a clear sandwich. Oh, does Barry tell everyone that story? <laughs> You're right. And these are just his voice lines. His actions speak even louder than his silver serpent. The man rushes to find his daughter as soon as he can, giving no thought to his own safety. But when he bumps into Natalia, he shifts right into dad mode and tries to keep her safe. No, 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 no. It's too dangerous for you to come along. You can tell he's still trying to be a good father by the way he treats Natalia, even though I'm still going to say that he did nothing wrong. Okay, well, what matters is that you're safe. Let's just be honest, there's nothing bad about him in this game. The love he has for his daughter is so fierce that he turns his worry into vengeance when he thinks she's dead. I'm gonna wreck this island for what it did to her. Which then he shifts that entire hatred into killing Alex. I'm putting you and your goddamn family in the ground! Look, bottom line is that this dope-ass motherfucker is S-tier material hands down. It's no wonder he's got a bad back since he's carrying this entire game. I'll throw my back out if I try to lug this thing. And not only does he fight Alex Wesker's mutated form twice and helps kill her, he also reunites with his daughter, completing both of their arcs, and adopts Natalia. Doesn't send her away for foster care or whatever, but brings her into his own home. The dude is a top-tier father. Absolutely. Without question, up he goes where he belongs. Anything else before we move on to Claire? I just like how he has a small call back to the Spencer Mansion when they entered that research facility. I wish I could whip here. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I've had my fill of mansions. That's messed up. He's talking about me! It was a nice taste of nostalgia. All right, guys, we're nearly finished. Let's end this with Claire Redfield. I won't have you talking shit about Claire, Barry. That would be like pulling our troops out of Afghanistan level of stupid. Firstly, fuck off, bitch. That shit was your fault anyways. Secondly, he's right, Barry. Claire is so fucking dope in this, it would be dumb to say otherwise. Just like the others, she plays so fucking smooth, and her past experiences have her taking charge immediately. Don't worry. I'm gonna get you out of there right now. And don't forget that she has to nearly do 100% of the work since Moira refuses to use guns at all, leaving Claire to basically carry her throughout the game. Exactly! They're in a goddamned hellhole and Moira can't adapt even for the sake of her own survival. Do you, uh, are you gonna use that? It's more reliable than any person. If you say so. I mean, Christ, she's practically babysitting this 20-year-old. And then on top of that, when they meet up with Natalia, she now basically has two little girls to keep safe. Wait! It's okay. Don't be scared. How can you possibly think that she isn't peak material here? I never said her gameplay wasn't the shit. Of course she's fucking badass in this, I can't deny that. She's a fucking Redfield. What I am saying is that somewhere between the events of Raccoon City and this island, someone at Capcom dropped the ball in her personality. Look, I was super excited to play as her too, but I can't simply ignore a couple glaring facts that drag her down a bit. I don't see it. Okay, let me explain. Let's go back to her meeting with Natalia. For some reason, Claire in this is way too aggressive with her, barraging her with questions and shit, as if she's about to lose her cool. In fact, Moira is the one who has to back her off in order to keep Natalia from running away. What's your name? Where are you from? <sighs> Did that lady put you here? Where are Whoa. you? Down, Claire. Let me talk to her. 
Like, isn't this the same Claire Redfield who was gentle with another little girl in a city full of zombies? What the fuck happened to where Claire completely forgets how to calmly talk to scared children? But it's dangerous here as well. You'd better come with me. Where did that motherly instinct go? Fuck, I forgot about that shit. Apparently so did Claire. So, this is a completely different situation with another little girl. She has no idea who to trust. Oh, you mean like what she said about people back in the prison? It's more reliable than any person. First off, when she said that, I was reminded that her brother came to her rescue back in Code V. I mean, shit, that was a very Steve Burnside thing to say. You'll just end up disappointed if you rely on others. She must have forgotten that too. Secondly, that's a shit argument, Don. She saw Natalia had the bracelet on too, so she should have known that they're basically in the same situation. Whatever. So she forgot how to treat kids, no big deal. She could relearn how to treat little girls again, right, Joe? Fuck you. Bullshit. There's no way she would just forget about her time with Sherry. But it does lead up to probably her worst flaw in this game. This is so stupid. So while they're with Natalia, Moira is the one who cheers her up. What's your friend's name? Marty. You're both so brave. No big deal. This lets Claire focus on protecting them, of course. Which also makes sense why Natalia doesn't mention Claire at all to Barry, but instead talks about Moira. So, did Moira drive you crazy? No. Moira was nice. But it's Claire's apparent obsession with Neil that really starts to weigh her down in this game. How the fuck do you figure she's obsessed with him? Yeah, Bear, explain or I'm gonna call bullshit. Well, first, right after they lose Natalia, they find the note that Neil leaves. Moira immediately thinks it's sus, but Claire says it's legit. It says, head for the factory. And on a scale of bullshit to believable, Neil wrote this. It's legit. And then when they venture farther, Moira again questions him, but Claire goes to his defense. So, uh, Claire, why would the boss come here? I don't know. Neil just does things sometimes. Yeah, I think it was at this point that I began to suspect Neil. The guy was suspicious from the start, Joe. You should have been more alert, but I guess that's asking too much from you, huh? Back to what I was saying. When they get the Prometheus statue and find his name tag gently placed on there, no blood or anything, she says, We've got to hurry. Neil needs me. He needs you? That's pretty cringe. Shit. Even I have to agree with Joe on that one. And then while searching the factory, Claire is so upset that she can't find Neil that she just completely forgets about Natalia, a little girl who is scared and alone in this nightmare that even two grown adults have trouble surviving. Even motherfucking Moira calls her out on it. Neil, where are you? Neil, what about the girl? Fuck! God damn it, he's right. How the fuck did she go from caring so deeply for Sherry and Raccoon City that she would continue to venture through hell to get her an antidote that she didn't even know existed? To just not giving a single fuck about Natalia because her boyfriend could be in danger, which is another thing that Moira calls her out on too. Still no sign of your boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. Not only that, but even after they make it out of the factory, Claire wouldn't even admit that Neil wrote the note that she was so sure was legit just because it put them in danger. Neil and the girl weren't in the factory. No. I should have listened to you. Neil didn't write that message. He couldn't have. I mean, shit. Moira was the one who pretty much figured the Neil conspiracy out way before Claire did. Because her judgment was too clouded about the possibility that her friend was setting them up. Shit. Look. There's something I gotta tell you. I noticed something when Neil was with us. His bracelet never changed color. I mean, the living dead were coming at us from all directions. He must have been scared. No. No, no. There's no way. Got it? End of discussion. Fuck Don, he's right. I mean, Claire was too trusting of some dude that she possibly had feelings for, and that he couldn't do any wrong. Yet only a few hours earlier, she had said, It's more reliable than any person. Joe, you turncoat. You're supposed to be on my side with Claire. Don't be so stubborn, Dawn. She's still badass. It's just that in this game, they made her blinded by an obvious love that came back to betray her. Claire? Are you crying? No. I'm... I'm just learning to see a little more clearly. Fine. I'll admit that her character does seem to do a 180 in this. But at least she gets revenge on Neil, giving us a great performance by her voice actress, Allie Hillis. Neil! I trusted you! <laughs> Goddamn name. 
That being said, I'm going to have to vote for high B tier. Are you fucking joking me? Come on, I understand that she's probably not S tier in this, but B is a bit low. Look, bottom line is that if she had kept a better eye on Natalia and was more wary of Neil, then Alex's plan wouldn't have come to be, and dark Natalia wouldn't be lurking around waiting for a certain someone to read Kafka. Regardless, she still ended up surviving the fall and telling Barry about the island, not to mention she comes in and helps him kill Alex as well. She could have stayed put and recuperated, but instead she went back for him and possibly with hope that Moira was still alive. I'm so sorry. You were in trouble. And you came back with a chopper and a sniper rifle, and that's fucking awesome, so shut up! A tier. I'm with Don on this too. And yes, there is quite the loophole on how she survived the fall, the ocean, and the six months it took for Barry to find the island a mere day before Claire shows back up. But she still deserves A tier. Okay, I'll concede. The sudden change in her persona still frustrates me, but in the end she comes out on top, of course. I mean, shit, she drives a car with a star's vanity plate, so I'm good with A tier. Alright guys, I think that's it. Not too sure what other Resident Evil games we could do that are worth ranking. No shit, look at this thing, it's so massive. We wouldn't be able to fit in all the characters from the other side games we haven't even looked into yet. And we still have to do the ninth installment when it comes out too. Oh shit, that's true. Completely forgot about that. Maybe it's time to move on to a different franchise. All this Silent Hill talk has made me want to go into a new direction. Hmm. Interesting. Hey Donnie, did you really say that Peter North did the voice for Ghost and Destiny instead of Nolan North? Sorry, I was distracted. Idiot. No shit you were, you sex-addicted fat ass. Stop watching Go such vintage yourself. shit Come and on, pay guys, attention. That hairdo is giving you fucking brain damage. Up.